Hello and welcome back to Solomon's Cave and a new video on the pre-Socratic philosopher Democritus. As we have been making our way through the pre-Socratics, we have seen that at first they all tried to answer Thales' big question, what is everything made of? As the debate went on and on and on, one of the key elements of the debate became the question whether the world or the universe was stable, unchanging and unchangeable, like Parmenides said, or forever in flux and changing, like Heraclitus said. Two earlier answers were given by Empedocles and Anaxagoras, but most recently, and most relevantly for Democritus, the philosopher Leucippus had proposed that everything was made up of two things, atoms and the void. Atoms were the tiniest possible elements that cannot be divided anymore. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, possibly with infinite variation. But it is primarily their organization and how they clumped together that determined what kind of things they formed. And then there was the void, the empty space through which the atoms moved, which allowed for motion and change to occur. This way, Lucifer must have thought the world is both unchanging, since atoms themselves are eternal and never change, and forever in flux as the position and arrangement of these atoms is constantly changing. At some point, it seems, Lucifer caught the attention of an up-and-coming philosopher named Democritus, who would pick up his philosophy and turn it into one of the best-remembered theories about reality from antiquity. So, who was this Democritus, and why was he called the Laughing Philosopher? Democritus was born around the year 460 BC and he died around 370 BC, making him live to the ripe old age of 90. He lived a big part of his life in Abdera, Thrace, which is in northern Greece these days. His father was quite rich and seems to have made friends with the Persian king Xerxes as he was on his way to not conquer the rest of Greece. In any case, Democritus used his father's money to travel to Babylonia and Persia, to India and Ethiopia and of course also to Egypt, where he spent five years learning from the best the now country had to offer. After his travels and learning, Democritus went to Athens, a city that would later become the epicenter of Greek philosophy. But that trip turned out to be somewhat of a disappointment. Nobody knew who Democritus was, and he lived there anonymously. He claims to have met Socrates there as well, but Socrates didn't know him. Next, Democritus went back to Abdera and started writing, and writing, and writing, and then writing some more. He is said to have written at least 60 books, and he wrote about all sorts of topics. Yes, about philosophy and atomism, as we shall see but also about mathematics, literature, diet, like Empedocles, Babylonian theology, which reminds me of Xenophanes, logic, like Melissus, music, like Pythagoras, geography, like Anaximander, politics, like Plato, botany and zoology, like Aristotle, ethics, like Epicurus, cosmology, like virtually everyone, and a whole lot more. But sadly, as usual, these books are lost, and we only know about them from secondary sources. In this video, however, I will only look at a few aspects of his philosophy, namely his atomic theory, his ideas about the soul, his theory of perception as part of his theory of knowledge and observation, and finally his ethics. Starting with atoms, there's something you should know about them. The atoms are nothing like the world or the final product that we see. Yes, the characteristics of the atoms inform the material we see, but they are not the same. In this way, Democritus is much closer to Empedocles, who said that everything was made of the four elements, or roots, of earth, water, fire and air, than he is to Anaxagoras, who believed that the reason skin is like skin is because it is mostly made up of skin seeds. None of that for Democritus. So what are these atoms like then? Well, they have certain characteristics. 
for they differ in shape and size, as well as in location and arrangement, or position and composition. This way, Democritus believed, he could explain all sorts of phenomena, like why is iron harder than lead even though it is lighter? Well, iron is lighter because, on average, there is more void between iron atoms than between lead atoms. Yet it is harder because iron clumps together more, while lead atoms are spread out more evenly. Or another question. Why do some things stick to each other and other things do not? Well, that has to do with the shape of the atoms. Some atoms are smooth and they don't stick to anything. Others are rough or angled, so they stick a little better. Best at sticking though are atoms that have hooks and barbs. They can stick together like Velcro. So then, which atoms or which types of atoms are the smoothest or the slipperiest? Well, perfectly spherical ones of course. Those slip through all the little cracks and can never be hooked or caught by other atoms. Do we know of any substance that has this characteristic? Why yes. Fire. Fire atoms are perfectly round and smooth. They can, in some cases, be captured in a closed container, but they cannot be grasped or hooked like any other atom. And here is where we see a bit of Heraclitus come back. For of all the elements in the world, fire, let's be honest, also appears the most lively. You see flames flickering and dancing, moving and consuming, transforming things they come in contact with. And, like living things, they also carry their own warmth. So, at some point, Democritus seems to have made the connection between fire and soul, or more precisely between fire atoms and soul atoms. This soul of ours, as Democritus imagined it, lived inside of our bodies. He referred to our body as a skanos or tent, in contrast to some other philosophers who called our bodies a tomb or a prison or a place of exile. Alright, so we are alive because we have fire or soul atoms inside of us. Those presumably give us the ability to think and reason, and it was also reason that has given us the atomic theory. There's a bit of a problem when we are dealing with observation. For, you know, Anaxagoras said that if we see a certain object, say, hair, then we know that it is mostly made up of hair sheets, and hair sheets, in a way, are just minuscule bits of hair. Atoms and the void, on the other hand, are nothing like the object that they form. Remember the descriptions of iron and lead atoms, and how they clump together and spread out? All of that is based on logical thinking, at least a kind of logic, but certainly not based on observation. All this talk about smooth atoms and barbed atoms, we don't observe those things either. Any theories about the shape and size and position of those atoms is based on theorizing, not observation, or at least not direct observation. So then, how do we observe the world? Or how do we see, or hear, or touch? Where do those experiences come from? In short, they are all the result of atoms entering the body. Let's take an object. Here, a flower. Now this flower is made up not of flower atoms, like Anaxagoras might say, but a wide variety of atoms in a particular mixture and composition. What happens is that each object is constantly shaving off tiny little slivers of itself, say a mini version of itself, which for all intents and purposes has the same mixture and composition of atoms as does the original object. This is called an idola, an image. So each flower is constantly sending tiny little copies of itself through the air. These microscopic flowers then, if they are small enough, can enter through the human eye where they imprint upon our souls and this is how we see them. Similar theories are put forth for the other senses of touch, taste, smell and hearing. 
or, stated in his own words, In truth we know nothing unerringly, but only of the things that enter into our body and impinge on it. This does lead to problems about truly being able to observe reality though, for several things can go wrong if this is how perception works. First of all, since we cannot observe individual atoms directly, but only in certain mixtures and compositions, how do we know what atoms are like? For example, the sea is blue, but are sea atoms or water atoms also blue? If so, then why can the surface of the sea turn white on a windy day? Or, what if there is something wrong with us in how we perceive things? For most of us, honey tastes sweet. But sometimes a sick person will think it tastes bitter. So then, is honey sweet or bitter or both or neither? And this is where I think his most famous quote comes in handy, as he seems to recognize this problem and his answer is basically a shrug. By convention sweet and by convention bitter. By convention hot, by convention cold, by convention color, but in reality atoms and void. Meaning that true reality is just atoms and void, even if our perception is continually quite different. This doesn't make investigating nature with our senses impossible, but it does put a giant chasm between our perceptions and reality. Ethics. If you remember from the video on Lucipus, we saw that atomism is a very deterministic philosophy. Everything that happens happens because of how atoms are shaped, positioned and arranged. These arrangements lead to necessary and inevitable consequences, which means that the world is like a giant atomic clock or machine, where everything happens because of how atoms naturally behave. There was no purpose behind any of this, just blind cause and predetermined effects. As a side note, this view of the universe may be very similar to the modern naturalistic one, but it is in stark contrast to the Aristotelian one, where one of the four causes is the so-called teleological cause or the purpose cause. More on that in about 20 years, <laughs> when we reach Aristotle. And it is also very different from the theistic view that sees the universe, be it made from atoms or not, as being created by a deity for a purpose. And side note. But if everything is made of atoms and the void, including our bodies, including, as we have seen, our souls, and everything in the universe is, in a way, predestined to occur, as it all follows the natural laws of physics, then what role is there for good or evil? What role does ethics play? Does that even mean anything? Democritus' answer was... To laugh. When we as humans seek the good, that good we seek is purely internal happiness, or being content. Cheer up! Don't let the outside reality put you down. The good and happiness are all found inside of you, not outside. The good life we all seek, he claimed, is found in the simple pleasure of euthymia, or cheerfulness. Hence, somewhat apocryphally, he became known as the laughing philosopher. This does not mean, however, that we should seek a lot of pleasure. In fact, he was quite in favor of moderation. All those who make the pleasures from the belly, exceeding the right time or measure of food, drink or sex, have short-lived pleasures, only for as long as they eat or drink, but many pains. Now we have seen it all. So many theories about the nature of reality, so many cosmologies, and they all contradict each other. Bewildering theories from philosophers from all over the Greek-speaking world, but no consensus. Initially, Thales might have given the Greeks hope that philosophy would unlock the mysteries of the universe, but now we are actually more confused than ever. All of this is where we encounter a new collection of philosophers and philosophy schools. 
They are no longer contributing to the content of the debate, but they are responding to the fact that there is a debate. Some were skeptical, others became cynical, and a third group, the sophists, saw philosophy not as a tool for knowledge, but for power. Thanks for watching. If you want to support me on Patreon or become a member on YouTube, follow the links in the description so you can see my videos early, vote on topics, ask questions, and more. In the next video, we will take a small step back in time and have a look at Protagoras, often seen as the first philosopher of a new movement which became the bane of Socrates, the Sophists.